I'm going to get going. So um, my name's Christopher Gammy. So uh, my handle on Twitter is uh, Lindy Hop Chris. So um, this might put it into context as to what I'm up to. But uh, it's Lindy Hop Chris because I teach dancing in my spare time. Um, I te teach swing dancing, but I decided Swing Chris probably wasn't the right <laughs> handle to have on Twitter. So Lindy Hop is the main type of swing dancing, if you've never heard of it. I te teach for a, just a quick plug, I teach for a, a group called Swing Patrol. So if you ever want to give some 1930s dancing a go, then uh, check them out. Um, I'm building a, something called Dance Cloud, so um, it's for dance organisers to use. Um, it's basically a cloud service, hopefully does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. So it's going to give you some background. Um, the, aim, the aim of this talk basically is to demo what I've done so far. So it's kind of a, a it's not yet production ready or anything, but it's kind of getting, getting towards a point where I can start playing around with it um, in a real environment. A um, little bit of background. As I say, it's a cloud application for dance organizers. Um, I'm currently piloting some capability this year, basically. My aim is, is to launch a bit more publicly in January, February, basically piloting it with the dance school that I teach with, uh, which is nice and easy to do. Um, I've been, for this year, there's kind of a behind the scenes admin app that I, did, I didn't do in Ember, and I, a lot, I kind of, I was learning JavaScript at the time, so I kind of decided to do a lot of it myself, and came to the end of it deciding that actually I should look at one of those things called an MVC framework or something, which was probably the easier way to go. Um, so I'm about to launch, or I'm, the thing that I'm working on I'm going to demo is a, it's a public-facing web app, so members of the public will actually go in, and I'm building that using Ember. Um, so that's what I'm up to, and it's my first Ember application. <laughs> um, so this slide is why I chose Ember.js. So it's not got no link to. I'm not sort of trying to plug it unnecessarily or anything. This is just what I chose. Um, basically, my architectural design from the start was I wanted a complete separation of the server from the client. So the the aim is is that the server is just a RESTful API, and I can then connect any client I want up to the API. Um, and there's a number of different. Uh, there's kind of a number of use cases for the dance world where I. I decided that was going to be my approach. It's not the only way I could have done, but that's the way that I've gone. Um, so for me, a big reason for choosing Ember is I'm self-taught, so I'm learning as I'm going, uh, going along programming. So from my perspective, convention is a really great thing. So I love the fact that Ember just follows conventions, and if you stick to these conventions, then it hopefully should just work. So, so for me, that, that was really probably one of the biggest reasons for choosing Ember. Um, and I, I like the Ember convention because when I was, I think I was, I was looking around at different MVC frameworks, looked at Ember and Angular, and you know, there's a whole load of stuff if you Google it, as saying, people shouting that you should use Ember and people shouting you should use Angular. When it came down to it, I looked at the syn effectively the, the, the framework syntax, and the Ember one made more sense to me. I looked at some Angular stuff, and I'm sure if I delved into it, I could probably get my head around it, but Ember just seemed to make a little bit more sense, so for me personally. Um, I love the, the, document, the documentation guides, cookbooks, API docs, I've been using them loads in the last six weeks as I've been building this application, and Ember data for me is actually a big plus, so it's not there yet, it's, there's problems with it, um, it's actually moved on quite a lot it, um, since the beginning of September, which has been really good, and I'm using it in the application that I'm going to demo. Um, it's the potential of it. I, I was trying to work out how to format my API, for instance, and actually, well, if I'm using Ember Data, I just format it the way that Ember Data uses. So it gave me a framework to kind of cop uh, copy. So it's not there yet. I'm having a few problems with it, and I had about five days where I was bashing my head against a wall at one point, trying to get my head around why it wasn't working. Um, but I got there eventually, and yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's a plus point for it. And community. So I've been and things like Ember Watch, um, just reading through issues on GitHub and all that kind of to people like trying to help fix stuff. That's been really good for me. Um, so uh, just before I demo the app, just basically what's going on on the server. Um, I've got a custom built framework on the server, um, which does things like I've got multiple tenants, so dance schools sitting in the same database, and so my framework enforces the tenancy. Um, so that there's no leakage of data across different dance schools. I've got role-based access control, and all the business logic is enforced on the server. So I suppose linked to that question about security, it doesn't matter if someone goes in and changes something in the Ember app that I've built, um, because the logic, the final say on the business logic is on the server. So 
Um, uh, it's written in PHP just because that's all I know. So I don't know. Uh, probably if I, if I went out and learned Rails, Rails might, might have been a better, slightly better fit, but it it's work, works fine in PHP. Um, I'm basically just currently just serializing directly to the Ember data style of JSON. So this is a screenshot um, of a dance event. Um, so I'm, at the moment, I'm exactly copying it. So there's no conversion as it goes into Ember data. That is the format that Ember data understands. Um, but my actual kind of slightly longer term plan is actually to serialize to, if you haven't heard of it, it's JSON API standard that's emerging. Um, it's quite well documented if you go to jsonapi.org. Um, I think Ycat's on uh, the Ember team said that he'd like longer term for there to be a JSON API adapter in uh, Ember data. So my longer term plan is actually to serialize it to the JSON API standard. Um, cool. So just to explain what this app does. Um, so it's public facing, but it also has sign in. So it has a state where you, you can view stuff not signed in, but then there's some stuff that you have to sign in to um, access. Um, basically, the idea is you can browse upcoming events, you can register for those events. Um, so for dance schools, there's normally questions involved as people are registering. So it does those questions, uh, but then it also then needs to issue the ticket and so the person needs to pay for that ticket. So that's basically the work, it's workflow managing. Um, it mainly is, you probably describe it mainly as read with some write in terms of Ember data. A lot of the objects that are going through Ember data are never changed. So, so that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and one reason I've chosen Ember is the future capabilities. Actually, I want to plug in, a, it's not in there at the moment, but a calendar that the, the user can like fully search and everything like that. And it's actually far more efficient for me to do it in Ember because a dance school is not going to have a huge number of events coming up. So actually, I might as well just download all of those events into the client, uh, the Ember data store, um, and then just let the client do all the filtering and searching of it. Um, it's going to be far more efficient for me. Um, there's going to be a lot less hits on my server. Um, so that's kind of future. So um, yeah, my challenge has been doing this, learning Ember.js. So <laughs> um, as I said, it's the first time I've done it. The, my only real experience was coming to the May uh, hackathon that I had in this office. I worked on Jamie's team. And to be honest, Jamie pretty much did most of the programming. And I was sitting there kind of amazed at what was going on. Um, so I've gone from that state to, to building um, what I'm about to show you. Um, so these challenges are kind of things that weren't e didn't easily jump out of the documentation. So I've had to do a lot of research to figure out how to solve how to solve them. So they may not if you've got more experience than me, they may you may instantly know how to solve them. But these are the ones where I had to do a bit of research. So um, it's hosted on a wildcard subdomain where basically uh, I've got it there tenant.dancecloud.com where tenant is the name of the of the dance school that it's good, the server is going to enforce only getting records off that. Um, but of course. Uh, a user could type in anything.dancecloud.com. Um, so the first thing it has to do is, rather than showing the application, it has to validate whether or not the, the subdomain is actually valid. Um, there's a lot of countdowns in this, which I'll demonstrate, which took me a while to figure out the best way to do that. Um, I've got, I'm using Stripe as my payment system, which if you haven't heard of Stripe, I really recommend you look at it. Um, it's really new to the UK, but has been going in America a lot longer, and it allows you to do credit cards uh, just via an API. Don't know, hands up if you have heard of Stripe. I think, yeah, a few nods, right? So, so I had to work out how I was going to get that working in my Ember app. So, um, Ember data in, is still in beta, so that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, so, I'm going to show you the demo, and then I'll come back to some of the, how I solve some of those things. So, if this works. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I should probably say it's not my laptop, shouldn't I? Just before something, <laughs> before something comes up. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I'm typing in this. Um, so obviously, Swing School, this is on my demo website. So Swing School is the tenant name. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, type that in right. Yep. Oh, 
Uh, should be. Wait, just wake it up, probably. This is where it all starts to fall apart. Let's hope this works. There we go. Cool. So, um, so it's loading. So the th what it's actually doing here is it's checking uh, swing school is a valid tenant name before it fires up the app. Um, so this is the app. So as I say, it's not totally finished. Um, the workflow is all there, but I've got some cosmetic stuff to do. Um, so at the moment, as I say, I want at some point there to be this really comprehensive calendar that people can search and view stuff. At the moment, it's just basically just listing uh, the dance events that are in uh, the, the dance. I can't see where the mouse has gone. <laughs> there it is. Cool. All right. So uh, for instance, if I click on this, so it's showing the dance event. So at the moment, it's, this is what I mean about it mainly being read at the moment. So it's downloaded the list of upcoming events and just allowing people to search it. Um, one thing that's been a bit of a challenge for me kind of getting my head around is um, my models, I have tons of relationships. So actually, a dance event is actually, this page is made up of about, I think it's about seven or eight different models just in total. So I've really had to get my head around uh, promises because a lot of those are, I'm sideloading some. So the JSON package that's coming back from the server has some of those relationships sideloaded, but others aren't. Um, and some, I've kind of been playing around with preloading some meta models, so just getting them all off the server in one go. Um, but what that means is a lot of my relationships you've got some are promises and some aren't promises. So um, I've kind of had to get my head around that quite a lot. So, um, but it's really good. Once you get your head around it, it's made me actually clean up a whole load of stuff because I've realized that actually I can do things a lot more efficiently. So, so that's been really good. So just to kind of demo a bit more of the, of the workflow. So I'm going to click register. Now register is something only a user can do. So as I'm not signed in, it's taken me basically I've used the before model hook to redirect through to the sign in page. Um, so I'll just use oh, oh, don't. Where am I here? All right, so that's obviously authenticating with the server and coming back. Um, so I'm now signed in, so I've got it up there. So um, the sign in's all handled by the application model. I've built an application model that uh, deals with all those kind of things. Um, and so that's why it's now, this is kind of part of the application template up here. Uh, so this is where it does, this is with some kind of, um, I'm guessing most of you have seen Ember apps, but this is kind of a right section of it, the registration, so you can choose different settings for these questions. And Ember's decided which questions to display to the user based on what the nature of the event is. Apologies if some of you, this is probably going to be far too simple, but if you're new to it, then. So I click Next. So it's, che um, it's checked with the server as to whether or not that ticket's available. Because there's, with the dance, the whole reason I'm building this system is with some dance events, there's situations where you may allow someone to register but not sell them a ticket straight away. So they, effectively, they join like a queue of people and they're waiting for a ticket. So in this one, it's checked and the server said, yes, you can sell the ticket straight away. And it's given a counter. So um, if you use things like Eventbrite um, for buying tickets, they do the same sort of thing. They give you a time limit to purchase. And the reason is because is you don't know who else is out there trying to buy t tickets at the same time. So you need to effectively issue a ticket, but for a limited amount of time, the person has to complete that booking in that time. So this is where I've got all these timers. So you've got this one's uh, the 30 minutes, the defaults, given 30 minutes. So I can now proceed through. Um, and so this is actually the ticket that the server's issued. And it's saying that I've still got to pay for it. Uh, but it's in my, uh, you'll notice up here, I've, got, I've now got my shopping basket, which has got a countdown, which has kind of been quite easy to do. Again, it's really easy with Ember because you just kind of, uh, it, you just get it observing the models. So, um, so that's been quite easy to do. Uh, and um, just from a design point of view, like it, getting all these timers, one thing I've been really keen to do is actually allow, a lot of dancers probably want to buy tickets for multiple events at once. So if you go onto Eventbrite, you can only buy one ticket for one, well, you can buy multiple tickets, but they all have to be for one event. You can't buy for multiple events. So, so for me, I, I want, it kind of works better if you allow them to carry on shopping a little bit, but you need to make sure the user is aware of how much time they've got left. So you've got these countdowns. Um, so, 
So I could, in theory, I don't know whether anyone wants to see me buy another ticket, but <laughs> say I've gone off and bought another ticket. So this is, um, this is where Stripe comes in. So um, let's hope this works. Yeah, cool. So, um, so this is, I'm going to demo the, um, let me just grab things. So integration with Stripe. So um, just handling the workflow for how this is going to work. So this pop-up here is a Stripe pop-up. It's called their Stripe Checkout. Um, it's actually, um, what it does is it communicates the credit card details with Stripe, not with my server, and passes back a secure token to me that I can then pass to my server to charge the credit card. So I've got test numbers, so I don't have to plug in my own credit card number. So uh, if I put in a test number that will decline... Uh, uh, Two. Uh, uh, one, two, three. So Stripe has passed it back to Ember that's then passed it off to my server. So you see, and then my server tries to charge the card and it comes back as declined. So, um, so uh, that's all being managed through the controller. So I'm changing properties on the controller to change the workflow on the screen. Um, and then if they try again, this time if I try with a card that succeeds, I know this number off by heart. It's, it's <laughs> always better when you're testing to, to actually purchase a ticket. So uh, let's put 14. So let's keep our fingers crossed and hopefully this all, this one will go through. Yeah, so that ticket's now purchased. So um, that's kind of a really quick rundown. I've also, I've done some forms as well. So um, for instance, you can register as a new user um, through the sign-in process. Um, so that, that's kind of the other part of it. I don't know whether anyone wants, does that, is that kind of a good enough quick run through of everything? Yeah, cool. All right, so if I go back to this. So, um, as I say, if some of you have got more experience than, than me, you might know how to solve these problems straight away. But this took me a little while, and I had a really nasty solution for it that I just randomly tripped over someone's comment on Discuss, um, the Ember forum, and I was just, it was like a light bulb moment. So like, I can do this a lot simpler. So, so this is how I solved the wildcard subdomain thing. So uh, you basically d you defer application load until subdomain has been validated. So what I was trying to do before was load up the application, but get it not to do, try and not to do loads of stuff until the tenant had resolved. Um, and then basically show an error page if invalid or start up the app if it is valid. So it's actually, it's really easy, um, which it, it was this, someone mentioned this m um, method called defer readiness and advanced readiness. I, I don't know whether people know about those, but that was made this simp uh, really simple. So what you do is you fire up the application, but you immediately defer, tell it to defer readiness. Um, and then, so then I have a, uh, whatever you're gonna do, I, I'm, I'm using jQuery, a get JSON to a particular URL that validates the subdomain and then if it's successful you just tell say app advanced readiness and off it goes um, and obviously I just then have a error page that's basically just displayed using standard jQuery if there's an error com coming back so that's how I dealt with that one if anyone basically if anyone's got a better idea of how to do these things then do let me know but that's <laughs> that's the one that I came up with um, the countdowns so um, when I initially tried to solve this, I had lots of countdowns going everywhere. So there's some pages where, um, for instance, Shopping Basket, if I bought three different tickets, they'll all have three different countdowns. Plus there's the basket going on on the top, so that's four countdowns already. Uh, plus there's actually other things in the background, um, checking whether or not something has expired because it wants to do something when it's expired. So, um, so I, I kind of um, had lots of countdowns all over the place, uh, which obviously you don't, it's a bit inefficient, so it's best if you can um, avoid it. So I managed just through, because I was doing lots of research on Google, I managed to hit on a, um, I think it was a, a, a pull request for um, adding a new cookbook. So this solution is actually based on that. I can't take credit for it. But um, I was trying to find the link the other day, and I couldn't find it at all. It seems to have disappeared. Um, but if I find it, I'll try and post it. 
uh, basically, it, it uses this idea of a clock service injected into controllers, and I inject them into components as well. So you basically you just observe the service. There's only one timer going on, basically. Um, and I use, each time you saw one of those little countdowns, it's actually a countdown uh, widget component um, that I've built. That, um, so it's a single component that's reused. Um, so this, this is just a quick um, kind of how it works. Um, so you have an app.clock service, uh, which is an Ember object. It's got this tick function that um, uh, goes on in it. So that when, when it initializes, it starts running. Um, and the more efficient, so you can use set timeout, the JavaScript one, but it's better to use the Ember, I've been told it's better to use the Ember run later, which is the Ember run loop. So that tells the Ember run loop that in one second, I want you to rerun this, which will add a second onto the clock service. Um, and then there's just this property called pulse, which is the main one that I observe. Um, so what I do is um, in Ember application, I do an initializer which injects it. So um, it's injected this thing called clock service into controller and component, because um, they're the two places I use it. You could inject it into other things if you were using it elsewhere. And what that means is I don't use this observer one. Yeah, I, I mainly use it around properties, but I have computed properties that observe clock.pulse, which means um, that they update every time the clock pulses, which is once a second in my build. It could be anything you want in yours. Um, so that's basically. Um, how that works. As I say, I can't take credit for it. I kind of copied it off somewhere. But um, I think it's going to be, hopefully, it will go into the cookbook because I tried doing tons of research to find out. It took me a long time to find the solution. So I'm really hoping they do actually add that to the cookbooks. Um, cool. Any questions, I should say? Or no? Cool. Sorry about yeah. You haven't finished, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no. I was going to say about the, yeah. the uh, subdomain thing. Yes. It should be really, it should be an initializer, because then it's, it's part of the application's configuration rather than you manually creating it and then referring readily, so you can like create an initializer there. An initializer, so, so... If you create the application that runs the initializer, the first readiness does the request for the... Oh, I see, so that pulls the code into the application code or something. Well, yeah, how so do you... you you're, you're, the moment you say, like, application will create, refer readiness, and then do your thing manually and then... Yeah. Can, by creating an initializer, you basically say, this is part of how the application initializes itself. Right, OK. Cool. So that would so be the same code, but just pulled into yeah, that kind of initializer. Yeah, initializer. Cool. Yeah? On, uh, on that topic, there is also um, a lot of async routing code that uh, Alex McNeer has been Yes. So yeah. I think that might be useful for that kind of stuff as well. It's in since 1.0. Yeah, I did. I, so that's how I was used. That's how I solved it initially. So I was doing. It was on. It was. I was returning a promise from the application model route. Um, but what I what I don't. What I kind of wanted was there to be no application template or anything. I just wanted. I basically, if the tenant is um, invalid, I just wanted like a effectively like a 404 page saying no, that's just completely wrong. I didn't even want the application to do anything. So that's why I kind of moved it into that. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely the other way to go about doing it. You can do it through the promises. If you just want to show a 404 page, why is that you do it on the server? Because doing this on the client side is now, you've now got a slower loading for everyone who's typed to write you the correct URL. Yeah. Whereas you could just render a 404 page on, um, from the server and not render the Ember app and it would be faster for the majority of people. Yeah, could do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that I've got like the right solutions. I'm just kind of saying that this is where I'm at with it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing from my perspective, so I'm self-taught. So, I, um, so, so it's a little bit of kind of like building on like as I go along. So, um, so I try and do as much research as possible and things like that. And um, yeah, my server knowledge is kind of not totally there and there's a limited amount of what I can do on my server c at the moment um, with the package that I've got so I need to move to a better package basically in the future which will help me with that um, so yeah um, cool uh, don't know if anyone's using Ember data using the current beta anyone using beta 3 a few people yeah it's a lot it's a lot better than uh, there were quite a lot of changes when it went into beta um, I used 
beta, beta one caused me a huge amount of headaches. There were loads of problems. Like belongs to relationships weren't even working and stuff. So uh, luckily this version is pretty good. Um, with what I'm using it for, I'm not having many problems at all. So um, uh, just in terms of it, it was going through a lot of development in September and October, although that seems to have slowed down for November. I don't know whether anyone kind of knows why that is or anything, but. Um, it's kind of it's good that it's heading in the right direction, I think. Um, I'm still getting some issues. Like, for instance, what I want to do is when a user signs out, I want to keep all the public models in the store, but dump all the user store ones. And I'm finding that really difficult. Unload all seems to be the way, um, seems to be the method that's there to do that. But it's very inconsistent, and it throws causes errors if a model's in a loading or a dirty state. So, so that's, called, that's just one example of there are still kind of issues out there. Um, and the thing that I'm excited about, the next version of Ember, or maybe 1.3, is the loading and error states that Alex is doing. Um, they look really good. So I should be able to uh, do better pay, like loading pages if the promise, because I've got a lot of promises being returned from the model hooks. Um, and particularly error states as well. So if my server comes back with an error, I can handle those a lot better. Um, I'd like to start using AppKit or an equivalent build tool or something like that. So that, um, but I haven't wrapped my head around that yet. And testing is a complete, like how to test an Ember apps is, is a complete mystery to me at the moment. So that's something I'm gonna learn at some point. Um, and that's it. So yeah, I'll take questions if you've got any. Yes. Um, did you use one of the many bootstrap integrations for Ember, or did you, is it just, you just use the CSS? Uh, no, so I'm sticking with just the CSS at the moment. So I've looked at some of the bootstrap integrations. I wasn't, there's, there's kind of bits of them that I don't like, or I haven't quite got my head around as to why I'd want to do it like that. Um, so, uh, but I was actually quite interested by the Adapar um, bootstrap widgets that came out recently. Yeah, they look. Yeah, they were in the latest uh, Ember Weekly newsletter. There was links to them, and they look really, really good. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm planning on. It's like some of my some of the interface would work better with a few modals popping up, for instance. But um, I'm kind of doing that as a later thing rather than at the moment. I don't know whether you've got one that you'd recommend. Well, I guess the Adapo one sounds good because they've got other good stuff. But yeah. um, there was one called um, Bootstrap for Ember. Yeah. Um, which I don't know, was really good for components like you know mostly you can do just the CSS but like there yeah. are some you know obviously the JavaScript stuff and there's some things that are quite hard like um, button links like the active class being on the wrong element and stuff that's kind of yeah hard. I've solved that by just um, and it's not I don't think it's the right solution at the moment I reopen link to and um, get it to add, if it's adding an active class, to add it also to the yeah, containing absolutely. li element. So I've just kind of fixed that manually at the moment. So, yeah. I did find with the boot, uh, Ember Bootstrap that, um, and this might be entirely unfair, so please correct me if you think this is unfair, but um, I just felt that the speed at which they were correcting some of the kind of obvious mistakes was too slow. Um, there was problems with uh, little dialogues. Uh, some, some of it was just documentation. You know, they were asking, you know, in some cases they were specifying they wanted an Ember object, they actually wanted a JavaScript object or vice versa. And, uh, but in other cases, it was just kind of a pretty obvious defects which weren't. I didn't, I haven't experienced any, any of that interaction with them, but it is the only one I've seen. I haven't, I obviously haven't seen the Adipal one, which sounds good, yeah. but that was the only one that was Bootstrap 3 when I looked. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it, yeah. it seems to be, I mean, from my impression, was it was it's very well done, what, what it hasn't done. So I, I expected a little more, and maybe that's why my expectations right. were up here. And yeah. So. yeah, I think I just it's also a time thing for me. I'm trying to stick as much CSS as possible, and I can go and kind of improve things like that a little bit later. Yeah. You, yeah. you mentioned you're using Ember Data yeah. Beta 3. Yeah. Have you got as many have belongs to relationships defined? Yeah, they're working. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're, I'm having no problems <laughs> with those. I did, that was, the, the thing was, was in my first week of trying to, of working on it, I was using beta one and the yeah. belongs to wasn't working yeah. and I kind of thought it was me, yeah. basically, uh, because I didn't know any better yeah. and that was the five days of bashing yeah, my head yeah, against yeah, the wall, so, <laughs> yeah. Not an extension of that question, yeah. but I'm on beta three as well. Yeah. I'm using a sync, um, a sync, yeah. Yeah. Um, has many relationships and 
if I'm adding something to that as many, it's not updating them. And That's a known bug. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, as I say, I think I think where I'm <laughs> on this this where I'm lucky with is this application. There's not um, it's as I said mainly read and not write. So actually, I don't think I'm editing any has many relationships on it. I'm, I'm editing belongs to, but I don't think I'm editing any has many at the moment. So, yeah. Also, um, yeah. you've got a public facing app. Yeah. Facing a website. Um, so how are you dealing with like SEO and like server produced? rendered web pages for... Yeah, that's not something I've looked at yet. So um, it's one of those things, because I've, I've read quite a lot of the, particularly the articles that appeared in Ember Watch and those kind of things. And it's, it's interesting, it's because, so, so yeah, that website's not going to be indexed by um, Google, for instance, um, reputedly anyway. Um, I've got the advantage that pretty every dance school will provide a link to my website so that people can go and book tickets. So it's a bit less of an issue. It's not kind of like a public website that I need index. But there is kind of a little bit, I'm kind of unsure, there's rumours going around that Google are trying to solve the problem anyway because they want to be able to index these things. So it's kind of uh, whether you see it as a Google problem or a you problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't looked at it. I think it kind of needs a little bit more stability before I burn a lot of time yeah, trying yeah. to solve it. So, so, so you were like hash yeah. URLs, is that what you're saying, rather than the, like the push state URLs that are server rendered and pulled back to the cloud side? Yeah, I think there's, there's a number of different people have written different solutions and things like that out there. On the so, Canonical started to get, uh, get client side apps into Google is basically. Um, not to do full featured server side rendering, but just take the data and dump it out without any form of formatting whatsoever. Um, just dump it out into your uh, application page, and then Google can index that. Just there, completely unstructured. There's a, a service I think it's called Brombone, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there, there is if you know if you want this to be solved and you're willing to throw some money at it, there's a service you can uh, mm -hmm. you can use that will automatically crawl your page and render them for you. With Panther.js or something. Um, that's the easiest way, but it's not free. Yeah. Because it feels like no code whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah, that's all right.